Hello everyone. Uh, so I'm Will, just in case anyone missed uh, the fantastic intro Elliot gave me earlier. <laughs> and um, basically I started uh, with Merlin with T TDP at the end of October last year. Um, basically my role was split 50-50, half of my time being on TDP and the other half being general community engagement work. Um, but the TDP work I've been doing was stepping into Helen's shoes, as far as I was able to, working with Londoners aged 75 and over and funded very generously by the uh, City Bridge Trust. Um, so, in 2016, City Bridge Trust very kindly sponsored us to do outreach work focused on Londoners age 75 and over. And the aim of this was very much to promote under understanding and appreciation of the archaeology of the Thames. Having received a first class handover from Helen, I began visiting groups and organisations with members over 75 to give presentations, uh, to exhibit handling collections, and I also led guided walks on the foreshore and riverside path looking at the archaeology there and I helped coordinate frog volunteers in collecting oral history re recordings including from a few brave souls who had actually been swimming in the river uh, many decades back and one chap who had uh, left his initials carved in the mast of HMS Discovery. <laughs> <laughs> Over the life of this project, we attended 162 events and interacted with 1,173 Londoners aged 75 and over. In the 10 months I was completing the project, we did 53 events and engaged with 446 Londoners in that age bracket. The hardest targets to meet were the guided walks and the oral histories. Now, the former may have put people off because of perceived uh, problems with mobility on the foreshore, um, but the oral history target, I can't help saying, was a little bit optimistic. Uh, I'm just looking at uh, what the target was, was uh, 110 interviews, uh, and uh, what we actually achieved was about 16. So, um, yeah, I think, I think we were optimistic on that one. Um, Optimistic given the time available uh, and the other targets that we also had to achieve within that same uh, available time. I also had the distinct privilege and honour to help deliver training for you frog volunteers. And I'm sure those of you who attended my health and safety lecture at Greenwich will not forget the object lesson in watching your footing that I provided by appearing before you absolutely covered in mud on account of the mud that I'd just fallen into on the steps. <laughs> I did ask around to see if anyone had any photos of the state I was in and no one uh, put their hands up to having any. But, uh, feel free to uh, distribute them if you do have them. I'm not proud. Uh, so, TDP was, of course, established to record features on the foreshore rather than to uh, search for portable antiquities. But, of course, if we find anything interesting, we're going to pick it up and record it. Uh, my first exciting find, in the top left-hand corner, I'd just been told about someone who had found uh, a World War II explosive. And lo and behold, I bumped into this thing here, which we think is a Luftwaffe incendiary bomb. Uh, in February, Natalie very kindly showed Josh and myself over the Anglo-Saxon fish trap in Chelsea. And uh, me being the easily distracted so-and-so that I am, looked over my shoulder and spotted in the lee of one of the houseboats at, um, at uh, Chelsea this amazing bit of red deer antler with a hole drilled through it. Uh, I think Natalie was quite excited and uh, the, the excitement was uh, definitely, um, definitely caught on. I got back to the office, looked at a PhD thesis by a guy called Ben Elliott. It turns out this is probably somewhere between four and a half and ten and a half thousand years old, Mesolithic or Neolithic. 
Um, something that really excited me when I was handed it by one of my um, people on the guided tour was this little bit of metal, metal work we found at Bankside. I was really excited, I thought it might be Iron Age and was very disappointed when John, John Cotton said that since it was cast in an open mould with the back of it being sort of coarse, uh, almost certainly wasn't. But it does beg the question, what on earth is it? And uh, between us in the office, we were racking our brains. Curtain tie back was one thing. It's a, bit, it's a bit small for that. Also, a lashing point for uh, tying things in boats. Again, a bit too small for that. The best estimate I've heard so far was part of a sort of lectern thing to hold your piece of paper flat. Um, who knows? Maybe someone's got a better idea. Come and let me know later on. Um, another interesting piece found was this bit of uh, pottery here. I hope you can see it all right. It's got this lovely sort of swirly marbled effect and it's sort of green and white on one side and black and white on the other. Now, being relatively new to Thames archaeology, I saw this and I thought, that's got to be the work of a fairly contemporary craft potter. That, that can't be old. But of course, I took it back to the office. I was told it was probably made in Pisa in Italy in, I think, the uh, 16th or 17th century. Uh, I was blown away by that. <laughs> and uh, the other piece uh, I've got to show you here is a cartouche. And I've sort of clarified it in the <coughs> drawing next to it from a uh, piece of salt clay stoneware, possibly a uh, German import uh, Bartman uh, flask. But again, I've been looking <coughs> for uh, that cartouche to see if it'll tell us where it come from, or alternatively, maybe where it was going, but without success. So if any of you know your cartouche as well, then that looks familiar. Again, please come and tell me, because I'm interested to know. Which brings me on to what uh, I want to do over the next two years. With funding now approved by the committee of the City Bridge Trust, uh, and th this is quite new news, I only heard about this a couple of weeks back, uh, for another two years, we can now announce that my remit has been widened. Not only am I now full-time on CBT, we're going to be engaging with Londoners over 65 rather than 75, particularly those at risk of uh, isolation, people living with dementia and or Parkinson's, people living with mental health problems and armed forces veterans. So we're hoping to offer talks, lectures, guided walks, possibly even frog training and uh, membership, as well as art and photography projects to people within those groups. For those of you who picked up on what I just said about mental health, you might be wondering why. And it's been something of some interest to me for a number of years now, how and why archaeology might actually be able to improve mental health. Mm -hmm. There are six reasons why I think it's particularly good for this. It's real work. My brother's an occupational therapist and I pinched one of his textbooks mm -hmm. once. And it says the good occupational therapy needs to be purposeful activity and meaningful occupation. When you're concentrating on something you're digging, especially if you're troweling away, looking for something, looking for a layer, your concentration is so focused, it echoes mindfulness techniques which uh, people experiencing mental health conditions are often taught. Uh, when in my previous position, when I was a support officer with MIND in Aberystwyth, um, a lot of the people I worked with had had their psychologists teach them to use mindfulness techniques. By studying the archaeology of your neighbourhood, it can give you a connection with that place and with that community. Working as a team of archaeologists can help you improve social skills, develop self-confidence and especially self-esteem. Getting out of doors is very important if you're having challenges with your mental health. Sunshine and fresh air, even the feeling of rain on your face and hair can, can make you feel a lot better. And of course, as every uh, doctor will tell you, it's good exercise. And exercise too is something that will help with your mental health. But where does all this come from? Well, there have been a number of mental health projects up to now. And the first one... <coughs> 
in recent times really kick off in 2012. There are some early examples going all the way back to the First World War, but the current history of mental health archaeology really kicks off in 2012 with two projects. In Herefordshire, Mind Herefordshire and Herefordshire Archaeology Unit dug the Anglo-Saxon and medieval village of Studmarsh. This was um, a part of a project called The Past in Mind. If you Google the blog from the bog, you will find all about it. And there's also a, bo uh, a book available by Kate Lack. At the same time, uh, a couple of people in the MOD came up with an idea. Sergeant Dermot Walsh of the Royal Army Medical Corps attached to the rifles and Richard Osgood, who you may have seen on uh, the episode of, um, of uh, Digging for Britain that we were in uh, on Wednesday, uh, Richard and Dermot <coughs> put together a project called Operation Nightingale. Now that in turn has spawned a whole plethora of um, similar projects. Breaking Ground Heritage works particularly with veterans. Waterloo Uncovered takes serving soldiers and veterans over to the battlefield of Waterloo, not the station, and uh, they are digging up the remains of that great Napoleonic battle. Soldier On has uh, done work with veterans and with uh, civilians. The Americans got in on the, on the act with a project called uh, American uh, Veterans Archaeological Recovery, AVAR for, for short, and that has spawned, uh, spawned a similar project in Israel. And the Defence Archaeology Group works with Soviet serving soldiers doing archaeological work, among other things. Now, I did a little bit of volunteering with Operation Nightingale myself in 2015 in Yorkshire, and uh, with slightly better weather in 2016 in Cyprus. <laughs> that was great fun. Um, I then ran for... Uh, um, for Mind Aberystwyth, a project looking at war memorials across Ceredigion. The purpose of this project was to ensure that all these war memorials were correctly recorded so that if, heaven forbid, something should happen to one of them, they should be damaged or destroyed, we could hopefully have the information to reconstruct or repair them. And one of our, uh, one of our uh, volunteers produced this amazing uh, plan of the war memorial at Pontre de Vendergeit. And if you can pronounce that from the spelling, I'll be impressed. Um, so this war memorial, most of the locals call the place Bont for short, so I'll, I'll follow in their thing. This war memorial at Bont, um, it was, the diagram was produced using a piece of software intended to program CNC lathes to grind things. Uh, this guy did an amazing job completely repurposing this computer software to produce these really first-class archaeological uh, diagrams. There was another project uh, running about the same time called Human Henge, which took people out into the landscapes of Stonehenge and Avebury. And uh, Helen and I both contributed uh, talks and subsequently book chapters uh, to some of the research that came off the back of this. And uh, this book here is the volume that includes those <coughs> chapters. So saying a bit more about uh, what we want to do, there are two discernible models of uh, how mental health archaeology has been run up to now. Um, Operation Nightingale in particular has done intensive digs uh, and you, you have the good point of having a clear endpoint. They can be repeated, of course, um, and having accommodation where people can come in from wherever they are in the country avoids geographical exclusion. The problems with this are that they are often a very alien environment and that when someone finishes the project, they may find themselves back where they started. Of course, Op Nightingale has thought about this and they do uh, provide uh, follow-up um, uh, care and uh, encouragement to use the skills um, gained. What we're planning to do with uh, TDP and what has been done with the uh, Warm Wars project in Aberystwyth and uh, indeed Human Henge is something that's much more little and often. Uh, this can be open-ended. I'm hoping that people who join TDP to maybe improve their mental health will become part of the wider TDP for community and uh, either develop a hobby interest, or maybe even go on to develop a professional engagement with archaeology in the longer term. 
It's accessible from home as long as they live in London, but there is a potential risk of dependence. We'll have to be careful to uh, um, encourage people to avail themselves of other uh, um, other services if it looks like they're becoming uh, dependent. And of course, it is geographically limited within the London area. So I want to thank you all very much for listening to me uh, droning on about uh, my plans for the future. I look forward to uh, bringing you more news of uh, what we're going to be doing as time goes on. And I look forward to seeing you out there on the foreshore. Thanks for listening. Thank you.